We are excited to have the wonderful speaker, Dr. Srinik Shah, all the way from New Jersey to inaugurate this year's educational programs. I'm very confident and I'm also eager, just like you, to listen to this wonderful talk. Uh, before you hear about Dr. Srinik Shah himself, um, I would like to introduce today our moderator of the program, um, Dr. Sri Gundala. And she is a co-chair for our uh, Health Education Committee. Dr. Gundala is the founder of Hope and Healing Cancer Services in Chicago. She is a board certified in internal medicine, hematology, and oncology. And she is an active member of University of Chicago Medicine Transplant and Cellular Therapy Program Advisory Board. She is also actively involved in community education on cancer and is a regular presenter at CME Talks at Hospitals and Wellness House in Hinsdale. I have a lot more to talk about her, but because of uh, the good talk we have and the time I'm very sure we're going to spend it gone, I'll let her speak about herself later on. But I also would like to introduce Dr. Samir Shah, who you all know very well, who has been the only president who has served for two years in 2015 and 2016. He had started as an entertainment chair a long time ago, but recent activity is still continuing to entertain us. We had a wonderful karaoke program, some of you attended. But other than that, Dr. Samir Shah is a well-known cardiologist in Chicagoland. He was at Christ Hospital, Oaklawn, and also Little Company of Mary, and currently at Rockford. He's an invasive uh, interventional cardiologist. He is the person who brought um, Dr. Sreniksha today for this program. I would like to invite him to introduce Dr. Sreniksha and later on Dr. Gondala will be moderating. Thank you, everyone. By the way, I'm Sunila Harsur, <laughs> uh, president of IMA, and thanks for attending this program. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sunila for a generous introduction. <laughs> but uh, uh, today's focus is on Dr. Srenik Shah. Uh, he's uh, not only my classmate, but he's also my pakkam pakka friend. Uh, and uh, he's uh, uh, president of uh, World uh, Vegan Vision, New Jersey chapter. And uh, uh, his uh, practice himself uh, is vegan for 17 years. So this is the thing about Dr. Sharnik Shah is he, what he does what he preaches. Uh, um, you know, for many years, uh, he is uh, practicing a vegan diet. And not only that, uh, he, he, uh, he extends this to his patients. Uh, he is an internist uh, practicing for many years in New Jersey. And, um, um, uh, you know, uh, he does... Uh, 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 pass all his uh, knowledge uh, to his uh, patients uh, and he guide many of his own patients in adopting vegan lifestyle and experience weight reduction, lowering of cholesterol and blood sugar with great success. And as you will see in his uh, slides that how uh, it has helped uh, decreasing cholesterol and many other things. So, so Dr. Shah brings the wealth of medical and dietary knowledge and experience about vegan lifestyle and freely shares his expertise with members. Dr. Shah has uh, delivered lectures on benefit of veganism and uh, is uh, available for such uh, engagements. Uh, he's well traveled around the world and aware of positive effect of vegan lifestyle on the environment by reducing global warming and other environmental impact like disappearance of many wild species via habitat uh, destruction. Inspired by Swami Chinmayananda's teachings, uh, Dr. Shah is practicing meditation, yoga, and spiritual teachings based on scriptures. Uh, he has implemented also this in his medical practice and his lectures in New Jersey area have benefited many local groups in New Jersey. So without much delay, I think let's go ahead uh, with Dr. Sharnik Shah and uh, how uh, uh, vegan lifestyle uh, can help with our health. So take it over, Sharnik. If I may, uh, this is Sri Gandala, uh, Hematology Oncology. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hersul, for the kind introduction. Before we head into Dr. Shah's very interesting talk, if I could just um, um, just go over some of the housekeeping. Um, 
agenda here in order to be considerate and respectful to everyone attending today. Um, we are muting all the attendees, um, but we will have time at the end of the session for um, asking questions, of course. Um, we also have the feature of being able to uh, get your questions through the chat box. So please feel free to write out your questions in the chat box throughout the talk. Um, and as Dr. Shah pointed out, um, it is now uh, Dr. Shanik Shah who's going to lead the talk. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slide or? Not I'm... yet. Okay, my screen is on. Uh... Are you able to share it, Dr. Shah? Uh... In the bottom, the green share screen. I did that. Yes, it's coming up. Yep. Yes, we can see it now. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start. Uh, uh, it's healthy life, a vegan way, a clinician's experience. I'm a primary care uh, physician. Uh, so this is where the rubber meets the road uh, kind of thing. So I deal uh, with the patients, uh, their questions, their answers, and their physical health, mental health, and all those things uh, uh, I get involved uh, into this. And my life has been uh, full of curiosity, uh, I like to get answers to any questions. And until I get the answers, I don't rest comfortably. So a lot of things happen in my life and everything started with questions basically. Uh, so uh, like Samir said, I've been practicing physician internal medicine. I've been practicing like 35 plus years and I have been vegan actually now by now, like 20 years. So more than half of my professional life uh, I have been vegan, so I have a long, long wealth of information, experimentations, experiences, question answers, and all those things. So that uh, I'm bringing over to you. So hopefully you can benefit uh, through that personally, but more than that to your patients. And it's a wonderful field that we all should get involved in. Uh, let's, uh, for definition's sake, uh, get into uh, the different definitions of the meat-free diets. Uh, so vegetarians, yes, a lot of Indians are vegetarians, uh, basically, but they don't eat meat, fish, poultry, but they can have animal products like dairy, eggs, honey, things like that. So, but still the statistics show that even vegetarians have a high incidence of heart disease, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. So my question was always that despite uh, being vegetarian, why do we have a high incidence of all these diseases? So, so vegan diet, again, by definition is no animal foods or products, including constant, but it, they can have concentrated carbs, sugary drinks, oils, fried foods, et cetera, you know? And then there is a modification of the vegan diet that goes further into whole food, a plant-based diet. That's becoming more and more popular because that's more healthier way of a vegan diet. So for people who are on vegetarian, it's a jump to go into vegan, but for the people who are going on to the vegan, there's another jump they have to take it into whole food plant-based diet. This includes, it's basically vegan diet, but it includes whole grains, leafy vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, seeds, but no processed foods are allowed in the sense, no added oil, salt, sugar, things like that. So this really is the top of the line is the whole, whole food uh, plant-based diet. So like I said, my life is revolves around questions. So my, when my son was young, you know, he asked me one question and he says, dad, why can we eat plants and not animals? They both are living organisms. So I didn't really have a good answer. So I explored and luckily I came across a book called Life Force. It's a work by Michael Tobias. Michael Tobias, his life journey has been amazing. He's a PhD in religions. He traveled all over the world, studied Judaism, studied Hinduism in Banaras. He came to Kutch and he was impressed with Jainism. 
he actually took Diksha in Jainism himself, coming from Ireland. And then he wrote several books. He's a filmmaker also. So in this book, I got the answer that why should we eat the plants and not the animals? So the Jainism really breaks down into a single cell, a single sense of the one sense versus five senses being active in the cows, for example, versus unicellular organisms. So they say, if you have to eat, you should cause the least amount of damage to the environment. Now, this is, this is going back, Jainism goes back to four or 5,000 years, but their sense of preserving the environment, now it is becoming so true more, more and more so as we know. So okay. this kind of sense was kind of impressed me. And uh, I realized that there is something into this spirituality and all that. So I started digging further and I told my son that yes, by uh, eating the animals, we are destroying the organisms which are more advanced by the evolution and we are causing more damage. But that's all I knew. And then it took me into spirituality. A and then I started exploring. Then I had another question to deal with. I started telling patients that these are not the right foods and all that. And they come and tell me, say, doc, we know that. We know what to eat, but we do it anyway. We just don't know how to stop. So then the question came that, okay, they know what to do, but they cannot put it into practice, why? So that's where another great entity came in my life, Chin Manand. He had, when I started reading his Bhagavad Gita, I thought I knew everything. As a physician, I'm smart. I know how to handle people. You have to be nice to everybody. That's about it. I didn't think I needed religion or anything like that. But when I read Holy Gita by Chin Manand, I figured out that I don't know anything. It's, it's such a beautiful book, it, how it analyzes your body, how the body works, how the mind works, and how to go beyond the mind to control your mind. So this is where I found the answers for my patients that, okay, if you have a problem that you cannot stop eating, then the thing to do is to learn meditation, get into spirituality, go about the mind, and then little by little, your mind will come under control. But this is all, all spiritual, ethical, moral, yes but still not science. I'm a science student. I needed something more concrete than this. Yes, I believed in it, but I still had needed something more really definite that I can tell the patients with as a physician. So that's when I came across this, another beautiful book, uh, Diet for New America, it's written by John Robbins. Believe it or not, John Robbins is son of Baskin Robbins. <laughs> He's vegan and uh, so I came across this book. One of my patients actually gave it to me. He says, Doc, all the things you've been telling me to do, it's all in this book. But now we have something written up. So this book, uh, as John Robbins himself was a son of Baskin Robbins, he had a free access to all the uh, animal farms, factories where the animals were kept and all these things. he got behind the scene uh, conditions of all the um, uh, animals that how they were kept and all that. So the book is full of very, very graphic uh, and uh, very revolting type of descriptions, how the animals are kept. And which is really, if you read the book and don't cry, I'll be surprised. But that's not that it was. But on top of that, he had a lot of scientific data inside. He had a lot of experiments and a lot of uh, data he collected from various papers and all. This book was published in 1980 and it was a bestseller. And it has been bestseller for a long time. So he, realized in 1980, uh, one out of 10 uh, women were getting breast cancers in US. And he predicted there's gonna be a major breast cancer epidemic in this country. And of course, now the statistics has changed. It's one out of seven women getting breast cancer. He said that this is all about the animal diet. He himself is vegan. And then he has been one of the greatest proponent of, uh, of a veganism. So now I had a scientific proof that veganism is not only good ethically, morally, spiritually, but it's also scientifically something that makes sense. So this is where I combined my compassion with science, which was the best combination I thought. So disease burden from the animal foods includes hyperlipidemia, diabetes, coronary artery disease, obesity, many cancers, hypertensions, even neurological diseases like Parkinson's and MS, which I never thought had any connection with animal foods, were all listed there with data available. So I was really uh, surprised to even see neurological diseases. And of course, and 
this patient who actually gave me the book, he himself was in a pesticide business and he had MS. So he himself was feeling the brunt of eating all the animal foods for all these years and, uh, and psychological disorders. These are all, uh, this is burden created by the animal foods, which will, we will come to that later. So all these diseases can be prevented, if not 100% significantly with the whole food plant-based diet and how we're gonna get into that. So question still was that all these books were touting the animal food so much, but I still kept on asking myself, what is really wrong with animal foods? I mean, yes, I can understand all this, but there is something that has to be so drastic about the animal food that it causes all these things. And nobody talks about plant-based diet causing this and causing that, nobody not a single disease that comes up just by eating the plant based. And why is that? What is that watertight compartment? So another question came in my mind was cholesterol. What is cholesterol? I didn't know my biochemistry was not that really well preserved from, uh, from the med school and the scientific background. I, in fact, I asked, I mean, I got the answers later on, but I asked my patients, do you know what is cholesterol? And everybody tells me the same standard answer. Yeah, yeah, it's a type of fat, it clogs your arteries. I said, no, no, we know what it does, but what is cholesterol? Why do we have cholesterol? What does it do for us? What is its role? I must have asked about hundred people. I had only two answers which were correct. And they both turned out to be biochemistry students from the college. <laughs> they knew, and this is the answer. Cholesterol is an organic molecule. It's a sterol, a type of lipid molecule it is biosynthesized by all animal cells because it is an essential structural component of all animal cell membranes. Every single animal, whether you eat chicken or fish or beef, it doesn't matter. All animal cells, they have a cell membrane made out of cholesterol, period. So there is no way to escape whether you eat, a, eat a lean meat, lean beef, lean fish, lean chicken, whatever, it doesn't matter whether you're eating a muscle fiber or, or, or a fat cell. Either way, all the cells on the animal side will be having a cell membrane, including us. We, we give our blood and we have cholesterol. You draw the cow's blood, the cows will have cholesterol or a frog or a lizard or sheep, goat, whatever. Every single animal is made out of cholesterol. This was a very revolutionary thinking for me. Then I kept on Googling to find out what's going on. So what does it mean? So basically it means that every time you drink milk, milk or eat cheese or butter, yogurt, ghee, you are consuming cholesterol. Every time you eat meat, including chicken, fish, you're eating cholesterol. So by doing this, you're adding cholesterol to your body, which is smart enough to make its own cholesterol. We make our own cholesterol. There is no need to add cholesterol, but we do anyway. And this is what causes the overburden of cholesterol in our body. And that's what leads to so many diseases. If you look at it, one steak, 149 milligrams of cholesterol. Even fish, which has been really publicized as one of the best food to eat is not protective, this and that. Half a fillet of salmon gives you 112 milligrams of cholesterol. Cholesterol is always there because it's an animal. The people ask me, say, Doc, can I have fish at least? I said, well, if it grows on a plant, you can have it. Did you ever see a tree that grows fish? <laughs> so, so they start laughing. He says, no, you can't. Look at further, cholesterol in milk, one cup, 24 milligrams of cholesterol. But this was an eye opener. One cup of cheese, 256 milligrams of cholesterol. That means one cup of cheese equals to 10 cups of whole milk. They may be consuming skim milk, but on the other hand, when they eat pizza, they're eating cheese. One cup of cheese, 200. 56 milligrams of cholesterol. Same thing, cholesterol in yogurt, cholesterol in ghee. One egg, 187 milligrams of cholesterol. One egg, and who eats one egg? Even the fish oil that's been marketed as to save your heart, one teaspoonful of fish oil gives you 104 milligrams of cholesterol. I started laughing at all these statistics and how they how the uh, industry has convoluted uh, our minds, uh, not just the patients, but the physicians also. Because in med school, we really did not have 
official nutritional education in a great depth. So I was really knowing all these things really was opening up my eyes. But on the other side, you go on the plant side, zero cholesterol. Even if the people who have traditionally believed that, oh, cashews and pistachios are very high in cholesterol, we should not be eating, wrong. You Google it, cashew, zero cholesterol. Pistachio, zero cholesterol. Beans, zero cholesterol. Every plant-based diet will have a zero cholesterol. So this is like a watertight compartment. So because unlike the animal cells, our cell, the plant cell walls are made of cellulose, zero cholesterol. Cellulose is insoluble in water, gives you main constituents of the plant cell walls. It's a polysaccharide. It's indigestible, so it never really creates any issues for you. If at all, it benefits, which we'll come to that later. So plants have zero cholesterol, animals are full of cholesterol. So it, to me, it was no brainer to go vegan, obviously, because if you switch it, then your cholesterol should drop. The only thing is that I did not have any firm proof because I was vegan myself, and then I had patients who were vegetarians, half of them where they were ready to go, they were not ready to go. So the real bang for the buck came from this patient, Marie. She came to me, 62 year old, white female. Her ex was Italian and they had just come back traveling. In Italy, they ate everything. Her cholesterol was 270 and her LDL 162. This was data from her own doctor actually. She traveled to like three and a half, half hours to come see me. I said, why would you come that far? He says, oh, because my mother is in your next town. And uh, she said that you're very good and I have this asthmatic bronchitis, can you take care of it? I said, yeah, I will. But meanwhile, he says, look at my numbers. These are so bad. I said, what did your doctor say? He says, well, go on statin, you need it, Marie. Otherwise you're gonna get a heart attack. But I don't want to go on a statin. And uh, I said, so what did you do? He says, well, I went to an endocrinologist to get a consultation. And they told me the same thing, Marie, your numbers. And she was skinny. She was not overweight either. I said, he says, so Marie, you have to go on a pill. So she asked me, he says, doc, is there any way you can reduce my cholesterol? I don't want to take a pill. So I asked her a question with my little bit of compassion background and now the strong vegan background. I asked her, Marie, I'm gonna ask you one question. Let's see how you answer. I said, if you try to catch something and it runs away, what would you do? 99% of the people I asked the question, they said, well, we'll go after. That's traditional answer. But she, she was smart. She started smiling. He says, doc, I got it. Animals have legs. They're running for their life. If they are running away and I'm trying to catch them, I'll let them go. I'll go for the plant-based diet. That day, she went vegan, 100%. She gave up all the animal products completely. In eight weeks, I, this is what I did at my office. Cholesterol dropped from 270 to 162. LDL dropped from 162 to 94, no medicine. And she texted me. She actually had a finger stick cholesterol done at one of the supermarket. And she knew some <laughs> of our Indian words says, Danyavad, shukriya, thank you. My cholesterol has reduced by 105 points in six weeks. Thanks for your wisdom and great advice. So this was my firm belief now. Now belief in veganism was becoming more and more stronger because these are, these are the people who are like trench soldiers, right? Uh, like I had gathered so much information and I'm not someone who would jump into anything just by, just by listening or, you know, I had to re research so much and get all this information. Like, you know, I did all those things, but these people come to you and they have full faith in you. And they, I tell them jump, they will jump. So my, all my presentations are dedicated to my beautiful patients because they have so much faith in me. So I told him, I said, Marie, do that. And she did it. And no question asked, she did not even went to Google, no research, nothing. So I was so amazed that the cholesterol can drop that much because she was eating everything, meat, everything. So in her case, I saw a tremendous drop in the cholesterol. So animal foods are, how are we really affecting us? One of the biggest uh, calamity is the heart attacks, heart disease, we all know, uh, and the blood clot and cholesterol plaque and all those things. The heart disease in the United States has very, very dismal uh, statistics. It's a leading cause of death for all adults. 
one person dies every 36 seconds in the United States from a heart disease. Almost 700,000 people die from heart disease. One in four deaths are caused by the heart disease. And the total cost is $219 billion. This is the data collected from CDC. Every year, we spend so much money. And yet there are some countries that are, there is no heart disease. Central Africa, Papua New Guinea, rural China, Okinawa, you don't see any heart disease. In fact, there are no cardiologists there. Cardiologists will be out of business because there is no heart disease. Why? There is a reason. The reason is Western diet versus whole food plant-based diet. Uh, in Papua New Guinea, they had noticed that people who were settled in the inner corners of the jungles, uh, they had no heart disease. But as soon as they move to the big cities and they start adopting Western diet, that's when they found out that their heart disease incident goes up. So cardiovascular care is more or less like a palliative care. It's a treatment rather than prevention. So repetitive blood tests, cholesterols, liver enzymes, blood sugars, statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, blood thinners, and all their complications, myopathies, neuropathies, hyperglycemia, hemorrhages, bypass surgeries, half a million bypass surgeries we do every year with fatality rate of 3%, 15,000 people die intraoperatively. Stent insertion, 1 million, 1.2% fatality rate, 12,000 deaths every year. All this can be prevented with a whole food plant-based diet. We have insanity going on in this country. There is, uh, there is so much commercial interest in treatment, but there is no commercial interest in prevention. Of course, we know cholesterol is not everything. Now we have a lot of research available. Uh, of course, vascular endothelial cell injury is one of the main factor behind it, which can be, you know, which is induced by metabolic syndrome, hypertension, smoking, there is a chemical called TMAO, or trimethylene and nitrous oxide. It is produced by bacteria, which actually feed on high meat and fish diet only. So people who are on a whole food plant-based diet, their TMO level is zero, literally. They have no TMO, diabetes, sedentary lifestyle. So all these factors definitely play a major role besides the cholesterol. But if you really look at it, we have other markers besides cholesterol. Uh, saturate, CRP, specific CRP, plasma viscosity, again, TMAOs. But these are not, TMO is not commercially available except in certain limited labs and all that. But if you look at it, basically vascular endothelial cell gets injured by the, by the food, which is really not healthy. Uh, so plant-based diet can intervene at every single step, especially if it is a low salt, low fat, low cholesterol, low sugar, which is whole food plant-based diet, because vegan also can be a major uh, catastrophe creator for you if, if taken in a wrong way. So uh, we'll get, which we'll get more into that later on. So low fat, low, low salt, cholesterol, low sugar diet, plant-based diet interferes. It prevents the vascular endothelial cell injury. And then LDL oxidation, oxidized LDL, which is ultimately caused for macrophage activation and then inflammatory uh, situation in the plaque, which breaks off. So polyphenols present in a plant-based diet and the low levels of TMO so can intervene at each and every step. So even from the vascular endothelial point of view, the plant-based diet has significant effect, uh, advantageous effect on the prevention of the heart disease. So there was a study done by Dean Ornis, who is considered a, a vegan guru uh, out of California. Uh, he's, it's the, the, cohort was small, 48 people, but he studied them over five years, 28 and 20. He found out that there was a regression of atherosclerosis, let alone none of the statins even shows the regression, but he, he had a total a whole food plant-based diet with uh, pretty much no oil or very minimal oil. And uh, he saw 82% people showed the regression of atherosclerosis and 91% reduction in anginal episodes. But in the control group, which was given traditional American Heart Association diet at that time, it showed progression of atherosclerosis more than twice. Cardiac events were noted. Dean Ornish, name to remember in the vegan uh, literature. In 1941, this is interesting. 
Norway was occupied by Germans who took away their livestock. So by forcibly they were made to go on a plant-based diet. But curious thing happened in four years time, the heart disease in Norway went down by 58%. It was very interesting. We have to thank Germans for something. There was another study that was published in American Journal of Cardiology uh, in 2017. This is where the effect of carbohydrates start becoming more uh, prominent. Almost 200,000 people were, were enrolled, data collected over 20 years. They found out that healthier plants were associated with substantially lower coronary artery diseases versus less healthy plant foods. So they did 50-50. You know, so they found out that if they put 50% on an on a animal-free diet, like a vegan diet, their risk went down by almost uh, uh, 12%. And during, in that vegan group, they divided into some into people eating refined uh, you know, juices, soda, refined carbohydrates, potato fries. Theoretically, they're all vegan. And then and the another one, they put them on whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, very minimal oil and butter. So in that group, it went down by another 7% with the whole group, a uh, whole grains group. So 12 plus seven, 19% drop in a, in a uh, coronary artery disease. But in the people who were allowed to have a refined carbohydrates, sugars and soda and juices and all those things, their actually risk went up by 10%. So high carb diet, refined sugars and all that were just as bad as animal foods. That's why the whole food plant-based diet is becoming more and more popular now. Next is connection of the animal foods with cancer. China study, uh, it was done, uh, it's been one of the best study done and very comprehensive study. One of the best uh, study done in nutritional field. They did it as in China uh, because China has a unique uh, study population at least at that time that a lot of people were living in the rural China and they had never been to major cities that they had traditional culture diet. They had been sticking for thousands of years and there was no intermingling versus like you go to New York and we have all mixed groups of everything. You can't really follow uh, people following the same diet. So, but they had also another thing to compare was the Shanghai and Beijing, which were, had become westernized. So they found out that in rural China, one out of 38 women will have a breast cancer, but in Shanghai and Beijing, the statistics was just as bad as the other countries where the Western diet has been popular. One out of seven, one out of eight women were getting breast cancer. So it was another eye opener uh, with the uh, causation for the cancer. So recombinant uh, uh, bovine growth hormone is routinely being given to the cows. And the milk has IGF, insulin-like growth factor. And our IGF and the uh, uh, cow's IGF are pretty much similar. So the re recombinant uh, BGH increases the IGF. The IGM is, IGF is insulin-like growth factor is very neutral. It goes into the body and stimulates your sex centers. So a calf is, is tiny and has to grow. So when it goes into the calf's body, if it's a, if it's a female calf has to become a cow. So IGF stimulates the sex hormones and, and the sex centers and it turns into a cow. And the male calf has to become, a, so being having a neutral effect, but once it goes into the body, it stimulates. So the testosterone uh, dependent organs are stimulated and the calf becomes a, a bull. So the problem is the calves are young and they need to grow, but we are not children anymore. We are fully grown. Our sex centers already have been stimulated by nature and they get stimulated more by presence of IGF in the milk. And that leads to stimulation of various sex organs, the breast, cervix, uterus, ovaries, prostate, Diethyl stilbestrol. This is another uh, horrible thing that animal industry does. Diethyl stilbestrol, which has been now, we know causes breast cancer, was routinely injected to the cows to induce the production of more milk. 
until they found out that diethylstilbestrol, it has estrogen-like properties and it causes breast cancer. So now it has been outlawed, you know, and now it's been banned. So you cannot use the diethylstilbestrol, but America is smart. They, they are not gonna let go the dollars that easily. So they tweak the molecules. So there are still a lot of uh, hormones, a lot of estrogen-like substances being injected to the cows. The milk producing cow produces the other size of the udders are so bad that it, they literally have to rub against the ground when they walk. They produce three times the milk of the regular compared to the regular cow. And these have all this, they have estrogen like properties. They come in our body and causes the stimulation of uh, dependent organs. Prostate cancer, there is a, it, there's definitely a, a link has been established between milk and prostate cancer. There is 11% rise in a prostate cancer, people who consume the dairy products. Of course, obesity and cancer, we all know. Uh, and the people consuming the, the animal foods tend to be uh, obese versus especially vegan or especially people on a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, they tend to be normal body weights, so less chances of cancer. And of course, we all know that obesity has been linked with several cancers. So there are a lot of misbeliefs. Uh, specialists don't deal with all these things as much, but we do. As a primary care, they come and talk to us that duck milk makes you feel strong, right? So that's what they say. So I, I drink milk. So I ask him one question. I said, are you strong or the cow is strong? He says, well, cow is strong. I said, what do you think the cow eats? Does she, does she drink milk? He said, no, duck cow eats grass. So I said, then why don't you eat grass? If you think that eating makes you strong, there are a lot of genetic factors involved in what strength you're gonna be developing. It's, the milk has nothing to do with it. Again, the same thing, cheese gives you protein. Ghee is good for your joints, our, especially with our Indian ingenious, uh, the literature from Ayurvedas has been studied in people's mind and that it lubricates your joints and Yogurt as probiotics, eggs are you need for protein, fish oil is good for the heart health. But as we know, we already know that it already gives you cholesterol too. So there are a lot of data available now that can squash all these beliefs, but beliefs are difficult to remove from the people's minds. I had actually one time I was visiting a friend and I didn't know, but he had also invited an endocrinologist <laughs> and uh, we were just talking you know, from New Jersey and, and the girl was smart, the hostess, you know, she says, Dr. Shah, you are here and my endocrinologist is here. You telling me not to drink milk. And my endocrinologist says that you should have one or two glasses of milk every day to make the bone strong. So then I had a very, very good long discussions with the endocrinologist, almost 35 minutes, 45 minutes. And finally, she says, Renik, you're right, you're right. I'm not going to recommend milk anymore for the bone. It's just because that's what people want to hear. So we tell them things like that. So this is how, how, how superficial our background is in dietary uh, uh, field. So it's very important. Uh, so I'm, I'm so glad I went into all these things to find the answers for my patients. So do we really need milk? I mean, the biggest misconception is that we need milk. If you really think about it, Milk is produced by mother for the baby. Cow is not our mother and we are not her baby. Why are we drinking cow's milk? And even the cow's baby drinks milk for six months, maybe a year, and then it's on its own. There is not a single animal who drinks mother's milk forever, let alone somebody else's mother. So this is a huge misconception because the milk has become part of our day-to-day -day life. So we keep on accepting as if it's just normal thing. But if you really think about it, that's not the way it was. I have a lot of people, they come and tell me, says, oh, well, Krishna, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, was eating yogurt and all those things. I said, yeah, but Krishna was 25,000 years back, uh, 2,500 years back, right? And farming started 23,000 years back before the farming started, where were the cows? Cows came much later. 
before the farming started, people lived in the jungle. Do you think you would want to go and in a milk a, a wild cow? I don't think so. So this is how the misconception transpires and keeps on going by one person, one generation telling the next. And of course, we know milk is cholesterol, sugar and all that. I'll come to that later. High fat, animal protein. Also, the hormones we talked about. Antibiotics is another thing because there used to be, if you look at the cartons of all this uh, milk, if you see the, the cows grazing open in the field and things like that, that's, that's a wrong picture. It does not happen. In one small room, they will have five, six cows and they are continuously tied for, for giving the milk. That's all that's being done. And the cows are not allowed to roam anywhere else. So the cows are so close to each other and they're obviously hygienically, they are not the best animals and with their excretions and all that. So they have to load them up with antibiotics so that they don't get infected. And these are pretty much the same antibiotics that we use. So obviously when, when we get sick and the antibiotic resistance has become a major issue in the human population, part of that is because of the use of antibiotics in the, in the cows. And of course, other somatic cells are mixed with the milk and all that. So really there is no need for milk. Other problems, it does raise your blood sugar because the uh, lactase is what divides the milk into lactose into uh, lactose and galactose. So the lactase enzyme, so lactose itself is, is a sugar. 40% of the milk's calories is, comes from lactose. So no wonder the blood sugar goes up. And of course, the hormones which are added, not just the breast cancer, but a lot of other uh, female diseases, uh, early puberty is a major issue in this country. Several years back, I read in the internet, the news nine-year-old girl got pregnant. Her cycles already had started at the age of nine. And I remember in India, like used to be, minarchy used to be like 12, 14, which was very common here, not anymore because we are exposed to estrogen-like substances so much. And not just the milk, also the, the cosmetics are also high in estrogen. People want their skin to be supple and soft and all that. It comes with a price. So all this uh, tremendous amount of, and, and who drinks milk, literally? Nobody really drinks milk nowadays. It's, it's cheese, it's the 10 times stronger than the milk and the ice cream and all the various products, the pizza, all those things has caused early puberty. And early puberty is not as benign as we think. The girl looks like a woman and inside she's a child. So imagine the psychosomatic, you know, psychosomatic complaints that people come up with. There is so much because people are looking at her as a well-developed female, but inside she's a child. We are robbing them of their childhood even. So all these things are happening. I read uh, an article in uh, Discover magazine uh, that this actually studied uh, the Bush women. They used to have, uh, as far as I remember, like 120 menstrual cycles in their lifetime. And so that comes at about 10 years of productivity. Now, on an average, we have about 410 menstrual cycles because of the early puberty and late menarche, I mean, late menopause. So all these things, again, uterine fibroid, breast cancer, breast tumors, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, so all those things are added problems with the milk. And of course, the antibiotics and all those things we talked about. The another strange thing is that you, we, that you may not even be familiar with that. The milk producing cows in commercial dairies are artificially inseminated routinely. There used to be a time that the farmer used to leave the cows wild and whenever the cow will have internal urge to get pregnant, she will mate and the, and the, and the calf will be born. The farmer will be happy that, okay, God gave me the, another cow and I'm happy for it. Not anymore. Artificial insemination is routinely done. In, it's a veterinarian practice in the veterinarian industry. And also they give very high quality winter feed. So believe it or not, the cows are kept pregnant and lactating. It's an, it was an eye opener for me, 300 days a year. And this is being done since 1920s and with different methods developed over the period of years. So sometimes you wonder, so normally, okay, so the, so the cow delivers and then the milk flow starts. 
Okay, that's understandable. Milk flow continues about a year and a half, two years. And as the milk flow starts going down, they again artific artificially inseminate. Another pregnancy starts, nine months waiting, and then, but they don't want to wait. They don't want to wait while the patients, the, the, the calves, nine months of pregnancy, they don't want to wait because they're mis missing. So artificial insemination and a high quality of interfeed keeps them lactating while they're pregnant. Now, I had never heard a situation like that, but it is true. The studies have been done that they can lactate and pregnant at the same time. And the thing is that the pregnancy being a high estrogen state, the estrogen level goes through the roof. So actually at one time, the Europe had banned the, the import of the cheese and dairy products from US because US was very cunning and, and very notorious for having this pregnant lactating females, cows, right? So they were actually had banned the cheese, but now under the effect of commercializations, even the Europe is doing all these things. So this is, so the high estrogen amount that is present in that lactating pregnant cow goes in our body, which is apoleptically higher than a regular cow will have amount of estrogen. So again, meat and cancer, WHO has already declared processed meats, cancer causing. CDC says that 40% cause of the cancer is diet, which can be prevented. Milk and cancer again came out of the China study that the casein, which is present in the milk is uh, responsible and promoting all stages of cancer process. So now we know the environmental chemicals have a lot of impact on the, uh, on the cancers. Whether we know it or not, studies are done or not, but a lot of times these studies take a long time. This is a simple logical way of looking at it. There are two kinds of chemicals, fat soluble and water soluble. The animals are all made out of cholesterol, so it's fat. So chemicals coming from the animals would be fat soluble they will come in your body and they will dissolve in your body fat and will stay there and being released over the period of years and years and years versus whole food plant-based diet is water-based except the nuts. Almost all the other foods are water-based. So their chemicals are mostly water soluble. They come in your body and we are not camel. We don't hold on to the water. As soon as you drink the water, you got to go, it's out. So there is more turnover. So the retention of those chemicals in your body is very short term. So much less chance of cancer. I mean, to, it, this is too simplistic, I understand, but at least it's some way of figuring it out. So again, animal foods and diabetes, eating 3.5 ounce of red meat every day increases the risk of diabetes by 19%. Milk and time to diabetes, we talked about the lactose 40%. Milk also has been connected with type one diabetes, which is the, because of the A1 beta casein in the milk protein, along with other environmental factors has been known to cause type one diabetes. Osteoporosis is kind of a weird story also, because you know they say, oh, you have to drink milk so you can, your bones become strong and all that. I said, this is one of the highest country that has been, as far as the consumption of the, of the dairy, and yet every third patient walking in my practice has osteoporosis, how come? So again, there are theories and none of those are really 100% root, but they have proven that the countries with the high animal protein intake have a high hip fracture incidence also. Fiber, as you know, is, is the best, best source is whole food plant-based diet. So the fiber is roughage. It basically rubs against your inner lining of your intestines and it scrubs out all the cells the dying cells are all scrubbed away and the healthy cells come in the front, which has a less oncogenes on them, less chances of cancer. And the old cells, which has dying cells have a less chances of less capacity to fight against the cancer. So that's why fiber, high fiber diet has been linked with the reduction in the, in the incidence of cancer. Plus now we know that every cell has a cell wall, which is made out of cholesterol in our body. Normally these cells are squeezed in the 
large intestine and the cholesterol is reabsorbed because it's very important for the body. But the sponge, the, 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 the fiber works like a sponge. It holds on to these dying cells or dead cells. And when, it, when you move your bowel, it take it out. So actually, if you look at the oatmeal, uh, Quaker, Oats, Quaker Oats claims that we reduce cholesterol by 15%. So there is, it's a win-win situation on the whole food plant-based diet. There is no cholesterol. Plus, there is a good chance it will reduce your cholesterol also. And of course, we all know the benefits of the fiber. It improves your gut microbe biomes because on the, the, any, the bacteria which uh, feeds on this whole food plant-based diet, they manufacture vitamin K, B12, B1, folate, etc. B12 is very interesting phenomenon because almost all the vegans uh, will need to take a B12. And I'll come to that later, but while I'm here, I'll talk about it. The thing is that uh, B12, the only source really in the society is the animal food. So uh, people who go on a vegan diet, their B12 level goes down quite a bit. And uh, so I always thought that why is that the case? If vegan diet is so good, how come we don't have B12? There is no, no diet. So more research again showed me that uh, the cows get B12 from their feed, actually. The feed which comes from the farm is not a sterile food. So they just give it to the cow. There are millions of bacteria on them. This bacteria go in the cow's intestine and produce the B12 for the cow. And when we consume the cow or the cow products, we get B12 in our diet. But we live in a society which are very hygienic and sterile society. So our food is all irradiated, cleaned out, washed out, everything. So we lose advantage of those bacteria. So theoretically, if we all lived in a jungle and drank off the streams and picked up the fruits from a tree and started eating, we will have plenty of bacteria. We will have no problem of the B12. So that's where the, my equation kind of fell into the right place. So fiber, of course, it lowers your cholesterol, blood sugars, constipation, we already know, also cuts down the incidence of diverticulosis and and some cancers, breast cancer reduction also has been noticed. So if you look, compare chicken to with the black beans, for, for example, one cup of chicken will give you protein, 15 grams, black beans, same thing, 15 grams. But one cup of chicken gives you 123 milligrams of cholesterol, black beans, zero. And fiber, zero in chicken because it doesn't grow on a tree. And then black beans have 28 grams of fiber. Your daily intake recommended is 60 grams. And so it's more than enough. So fiber also is a good source. Environment is one of the last and the most important thing I'd like to talk about. For that, I'll take you back into something called rule of 10. This I studied with my son when he was in eighth grade biology textbook. This appeared in that and I was curious to find out what it is. Basically what happens is they found out and this is a scientific truth has been observed the phenomenon throughout the earth. They said that any organism when wants to consume other organism, it can exchange only 10% of the calories. Say if a chicken wants to eat wheat, for example, the whole plant will be standing there, but its roots are useless. The stalk is useless, leaves are useless, flowers are useless, only the grains are useful to the chicken. That is 10%. So the whole plant of the wheat kept the 90% of the calories to itself, will not share with anything. But look at the next level. If a fox wants to eat the chicken, same formula applies. Chicken, one chicken will not be enough because chicken's bones are no good, chicken feathers are no good, chicken beak is no good, hooves are no good, all that takes away 90%. So a fox, if he wants to survive, he has to have 10 chickens. Just the way the chicken had to have 10 plants of wheat, right? So it continues and the lion again needs 10 foxes, 100 chickens and 1000 plants. That's why lions have big territories to survive. But now look at the practical point of view. Chemicals present in 10 plants will go into chicken's body, which is vegetarian or vegan. But 100 plants worth of chemicals will go into fox's body, which is not vegetarian. And lion, of course, 10 times more of that. So the higher you go on a food chain, more chemicals accumulate in you. Looking at it from environmental point of view, if 
and this was in the book. At that time, there was no word coined for veganism. They said, if theoretically whole world became vegetarian, then we will need only 10% of the farmland because chicken can survive on 10 plants, but a fox will need 100 plants to survive. So that means if everybody became chicken or vegetarian or vegan now, we will survive only 10%. 90% of the farm grows the food for the animals, not for you and me. We had gone to Yellowstone. You drive in 100 miles, 200 miles, 300 miles. You, know, you don't even see a single person. You see farms and farms. All they were full of grass, making the feed for the animals. So we are destroying 90% of the farms just to produce the feed for the animals, just because we insist on eating animals. But if we change that, 90% of the farm can be released back to the nature. Billions of trees can grow on it and it can absorb the greenhouse gases. So the environmental solution is right on your dinner plate. Same thing happened, bald eagles, which is our national icon, was becoming extinct at one time. Same thing happened. They found out it was the DDT because they used to spray on the crops. It will go into these small streams to the bigger streams to the rivers, it will end up in the ocean. Small fish will have a DDT and the bigger fish will eat the small fish and the highest. Bald eagles are the highest on the food chain. The DDT was getting accumulated on their eggshells. They were making them so weak. So the babies, the, the eggshells will break down babies will hatch before they had a chance to hatch. And that was killing the bald eagles. Now they have banned the DDT and the bald eagles are coming back to life now. So it's a wonderful story, but, and the same, uh, describing the same. So let me show you some, some more patients. Uh, one patient, 250 cholesterol, LDL of 179, in eight weeks came down to 183 and LDL of 98, no statins. She lost even 12 pounds. But with her, this is another very interesting thing happened. She came back to me in a couple of months. I told her, I said, let's do it one more time. You really had a good success. Let's do it one more time. She came back, her cholesterol went up to 210 and LDL went to 113. I said, Terry, what happened? I said, you had brought it down to 98. Aren't you vegan anymore? She says, no doc, I'm vegan. I'm not really eating any animal products. I said, think, 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 what happened? He says, oh yeah, four weeks back, she had gone to, with some of her friends to a, rest, to a seafood restaurant. One meal still was showing up in her cholesterol. We think that we eat the food, we don't, we didn't gain any weight, we digested the food, we are okay, we are done. No, the cholesterol which is extracted, it circulates in your blood for six weeks. And that's how it leads to plaque formation. And this is not the one example I have done it on myself and other patients also. So she did it 100% vegan again. She brought it down even less than 98. She went down to 78. And now she has been really strictly vegan. So even one meal can goof it up. This guy came to me, 229 cholesterol. Was, his weight was astronomical. He really listened to me in six months he lost 64 pounds, his LDL dropped to 116 from 150. But look at his A1C drop, again, with the weight loss, 7.1 to 5.4. And uh, another patient, Anglo-Saxon, 240, 153, dropped to 89, 166. And she enjoys her diet very well. This was, uh, uh, yeah, so this was a lady, uh, actually a nun, uh, and she dropped her cholesterol, but she was still eating eggs. So it did not drop significantly uh, from 144 to 127 LDL and all that, 223 to, you know, sorry, this is 170 uh, total cholesterol, this is typo, but her cholesterol, the A1C dropped. This is uh, her short story. I'm Sister Susan. Uh, working in a school. I'm teaching in first grade. Um, my diet is morning, I eat only fruits. Then um, afternoon, I eat for my lunch one cucumber and three to three uh, celery sticks. 
Then uh, uh, dinner, I eat uh, cooked vegetables and uh, cucumber too. And I drink only almond milk. Uh, my sugar level is now, my A1C is, uh, it was high 7.5 7. 7. 7. Yes. and now it is 6.1 6. 6. Uh, within uh, five months. I think I can bring more down to my A1C and I'm fine. Uh, so you can also follow this diet. You all will be <laughs> fine also. And my um, weight also is, lost, I lost weight uh, almost, like 16 uh, pounds. 16 pounds, 16 yes. pounds. Now, and you're also eating the beans, chickpeas, beans, and uh, chickpeas mung, mung, dal, mung dal, and uh, all kinds um, of right. beans. Yeah, I'll let her go. But uh, so so that's what it is. It's another video, but I'll come to skip that. In the, face. in the face of time, we have another uh, again, again, success story, uh, lost almost 45 pounds. Another success story with that. So we have a lot of examples. I have close to 150, 160 patients that I can even vouch for. So there are pitfalls in a vegan diet though. Like we talked about B12 deficiency that has to be vouched for. Uh, vitamin D deficiency is also, but this is very connived actually because vitamin D is not naturally present in the milk. It is fortified in the milk. So when people drink milk and they get vitamin D, it's again, uh, an, uh, it's a marketing gimmick so that by adding the vitamin D, people are made to believe that vitamin D and the calcium is the best combination, will make a bone strong and all that. But to take vitamin D, you don't have to drink milk. You can just have a supplement. So we recommend people to take supplements, B12 and vitamin D. So concentrated carbohydrate, like we talked about, is a major killer. Under the vegan, uh, it really has to be eliminated uh, and the oil, salt, and the calcium can be an issue, but there are a lot of non-dairy dairy sources of calcium available, which can provide, actually, the thing is that in the, in the milk, a glass of milk will have a 303 milligrams of calcium, but 50% is bioavailable. Other 50% goes in the stool. So you're really getting like 150 milligrams of calcium versus beans, a cup of black beans will give you 295 milligrams of calcium, but it's 70% bioavailable. So the bioavailability matters a lot. And that comes out a lot more than the milk itself. So protein also, you have to be very careful because the protein, uh, because you're eliminating the milk and fish and eggs and I mean, all those things. So you really have to stay up on the protein intake, iron and omega-3 fatty acids, all those things. So whole, whole food plant-based diet is a healthier vegan diet. And that's what uh, I've been promoting. And it's, that's what really ultimately full society should go in that direction. Then we will have no diseases left so, uh, so there was a study actually just came out this year. Uh, I mean, this month, February in British Medical Journal uh, was published on the third. And they found out that high intake of refined grains was associated with systolic hypertension and higher rising of the mortality from cardiovascular disease. This is a very interesting phenomenon. <laughs> so this is my invention. Again, I, I'm off bit, as you know, by now. So, <laughs> so, I had gone to Trader Joe's and the Trader Joe's sell the uh, sprout bean bread. And I was trying to figure out uh, the rationale behind it because now they have a low carbs phenomenon, everybody trying to stay away from carbohydrate, this and that. So I said, yeah, but I mean, for my Indian patients, what am I gonna do? What I'm gonna tell them? They're not gonna go to switch to bread from Trader Joe's and all that. So I thought and thought and thought. So I said, well, the moon is, is we can use, it's a protein. So ultimately I devised the, the formula and uh, say 30% moon flour, which is protein, chickpeas flour, chana basin, 30%, and almond flour just for, so that you don't have to add any oil. So 40%. Combination comes out, one, one bread, which is low carb bread, has caused major revolution in my diabetic patients. I just show you one example, A1C of one patient which he was just not listening to me. And finally I got so angry on him and say, okay, doc, now I'm gonna do it. He started with 7.9 A1C and no change of medications dropped to 6.2. I have other families also do the same thing, but this was quite impressive. So finally, just talk about cruelty. So there is a lot of cruelty involved in animal industry. And uh, like we talked about animal, uh, the artificial inseminations, locking them up, multiple injections and all those things, but they are also important uh, part of the environment and we should have sympathy for them. Artificial, we are stealing milk, like we talked about, 
The milk does not belong to us, but we take it away. Artificial insemination is, is one of the most cruel practices that bothered me. Somehow all the things were still okay until I came across the artificial insemination. And as you know, I was going more into spirituality and I was meditating more and more and more. As I was getting more closer to the soul, every little torture on the cow was bothering me. Before that, yes, I was still vegan, but I was leaving the parties with a, with a disturbed mind that, okay, everybody's enjoying, I cannot have it. So I, my mind was still hooked on it and all that. But when I came across the artificial insemination, it bothered me. I said, artificial insemination is a pregnancy without consent. Who is asking the cow that we're gonna make you pregnant? I said, if my wife or my sister or my daughter has to be artificially inseminated, what will we call that? That bothered me. This is rape. That day I gave up 100% and my mind became so serene because the command came from the soul that you are doing a good thing that some unknown cow is benefiting because every single product of milk to me was a product of rape and that's not right. So, and again, uh, all these questions come up. Bhagavad Gita uh, in the ninth chapter, Krishna himself says that patram pushpam phalam toyam, patra, leaf, flower, fruit, and water. Just give only that to me. And a lot of people argue with me that, you know, Krishna Bhagavan was eating yogurt and all that, but he was a baby at the time. When, Krishna, when Gita was delivered, he was in a highest state of spiritual state. And that's when he spoke Gita, who would you believe? Mahavir, of course, one of the biggest proponent of uh, non-violence. And Genesis even the, there is a, a Genesis also says that it, a herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, every tree and the fruit of the tree will be the meat for you. Uh, I don't want to close the chapter, but I want to tell you, and which I haven't spoken on any, any uh, uh, conference before. This was me and my EKG on October 15, 2001. I had entry wall MI. This was about six months after I had gone vegan and my old sins probably caught up with me. So I had an entry wall MI, but I survived. I was in the office and in two hours uh, they opened up, but uh, I did not, uh, I took it as a challenge and I had been running also uh, quite a bit for the last three, four years. On the day of my heart attack, I had run seven miles and I was feeling chest pain. So I told the cardiologist, I said, I'm coming tomorrow to get a stress test. That afternoon I had a non-exertional chest pain. So I said, well, this is it. So we did it, everything went well. And then, then I went into running more and more. I ran marathon in my, on the anniversary of my heart attack. And with this guy, you know who. <laughs> this was my Chicago marathon. So I ran Chicago, Philadelphia, New Jersey I ran, and Boston. And so this is my life story. I like to experiment and find what is best for me, for my patients, for my family. And this is my story. If you have any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. Um, that was a wonderful and insightful presentation on vegan way of life. Um, I think there are a lot of questions that have come up. Mm -hmm. um, they are on the chat box and I'm gonna read them out. Um, one question that has come up is, uh, can vegan food provide enough calcium? Um, yeah. And um, if you could kindly, you know, perhaps offline give, uh, you know, a little bit more information on that, I think a lot of the audience is very interested. Another question that has come up is the cost of being vegan as well as the practicality of it. Um, if you could share your thoughts. Well, I'll start with calcium. We already talked about that it's a bioavailability is a lot more with the plant-based diet. And uh, there are a lot of foods. If you Google it, that's what I tell patients. I non-dairy Google, just put down this non-dairy sources of uh, uh, calcium is available. And there is a long list. There's a lot of foods available. Beans are high in calcium. A lot of leafy vegetables are high in calcium. So there is no dearth of calcium providing uh, roots, uh, foods available on the plant-based. And uh, uh, the second question was, uh, the practicality is very practical. I don't see, if you look at the $219 billion we are spending uh, 
the cost saving is right there. And it's not just the, uh, the prevention of the heart disease, but it's the healthier lifestyle. It's not just the heart disease, but we're talking about cancers and, and, and all what not. There are, it's, 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 I tell you, that it's just beginning. The, uh, the, the vegan phenomenon is spreading the whole throughout the world. We have World Vegan Vision has a chapters in, in Mumbai and Ahmedabad and a lot of other uh, cities. It's, it's spreading here in Illinois. It's also there. Chicago is there is one. So it's, 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 it's really becoming a thing. People are catching up to it. So it is very practical. When I came in 1980, I used to go to restaurants and I tell them I'm vegetarian. At that time, I was not even vegan. They will give me boiled vegetables and that's it. But now all the restaurants are, are very much wired uh, to for the providing the, the vegan food. So it's really not a problem. All my fam friends and families, and they all know that. So when I'm coming, they know that they will prepare only vegan food for me. So it's not a problem. Thank you. Another question that has come up is, um, I think pretty similar questions in terms of the nutrients in the absence of milk, um, you know, sources of protein besides lentils in the vegan diets. And then would you also recommend B12 supplements um, for uh, folks who are going to switch to the vegan diet? Yeah, B12, I tell them to take 500 microgram every day and vitamin D3, I tell them 2000 units. Even those studies in 2018, there were three studies came out and they said vitamin D supplements have no role. <laughs> but uh, for the vegans, I definitely, because my own level was very low. So when the levels are low, I know that uh, definitely they should take supplements. So yeah, I do recommend. And as far as the, the protein wise, there is not a problem, not just the beans, but even the spinach and all that. A lot of foods are high in protein, nuts are high in protein. So these are all excellent sources. Along with them, they also provide a lot of polyphenols and uh, phytonutrients, which uh, fight against the cancers, produce a lot of vitamins in your gut, gut flora. So ultimately it's the gut biome uh, that's gonna be really the forefront. So that's all can be augmented beautifully with the plant-based diet. It's not a problem. Thank you. Um, another question that's being asked is the concern over plants being sprayed with chemicals when we are concerned about the overall um, chemical you know, exposure that individuals have with eating um, animal-based products. How do we solve the uh, issue with the plants being sprayed with the chemicals? Well, like I, we showed a couple of slides in the rule of 10, right? So if you're, if you're not a vegetarian or a vegan, then you have 10 times of the chemicals accumulating in your body as it is. So definitely going on a plant-based diet, you are cutting down the amount of chemical coming in your body by 10%, down to 10%. Also, we talked about that the chemicals are water soluble and they're easily flushed out, even if there are chemicals. And of course, going organic, of course, definitely would make sense as much as possible. So they have this, uh, if you Google it, they have this dirty dozen, certain fruits like strawberries and all those things, they are routinely spread. So those you can go for organic. A lot of foods uh, like peppers and all that, it really doesn't, they don't spray because it doesn't have to be sprayed. So those you can take regular like that. So that can be manipulated. They can be looked around and searched around. It's not a problem. But overall, there are definitely benefits of going on plant-based diet because uh, as we saw that even the bald eagle was becoming extinct almost. So what are we? The higher you go on a food chain, you're paying a big price. And so does the environment too. Uh, Dr. Teji has a question. Uh, Dr. Teji, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Dr. Shah. Yes. Wonderful presentation, enjoyed it thoroughly. And the expanse and, uh, you know, very nicely, very comprehensive uh, presentation. But one thing, we are Indian. We mm -hmm. like to eat vegetarian. Mm -hmm. When we are in America, mm -hmm. and we want to use our uh, spices, which are very high in antioxidant and anti-inflammatory uh, you know, activities. So why have you, uh, would you comment on that? Because- Spice is no problem. Spices are fine. Yes. Spices However, it, it just, uh, I mean, if you were to prescribe a vegetarian diet, 
to mm-hmm. an Indian how to provide Indian diet to reduce weight. Indian Rather, diet can be easily become vegan. We're talking about vegan, right? Not vegetarian. Right. right. So Indian I'm food is vegetarian. very easily yeah. customized to the vegan. The only thing you avoid is the dairy products. That's all. Everything else is fine. So meat, of course, you know, our Indian restaurants are should not have any problem as long as they know that it's a, so at least home cooking is very easy. Uh, you just don't put the, the dairy products. All the other fruits, other spices is not a problem. I mean, the restaurants have a lot of ghee in them and a lot yeah, of fat. Obviously, so, yeah, so that's the thing. Inch of, uh... <laughs> so Indian restaurants will have a little longer time to catch up versus non-Indian sure. restaurants. They, they are more aware. But eventually, mm-hmm. again, uh, World Vegan Vision, from our point of view, also we're trying to approach them, you know, give them some promotions so that they can have actually vegan menus available and all that. But it is doable. I, like 20 years, I'm in vegan, so it definitely is not an issue at all. But spices, yeah, definitely no problem. But there is, I mean, they're very important. I and mean, we are made from the vegetables and we are, you know, we have to have the same type of uh, uh, condiments, which were, you know, vegetarianism 50 years ago or 40 years ago meant they give you boiled vegetables. No, 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 and I'm not talking ape- about that, no. No, spices, you keep the spices, spices have no cholesterol, they're plant-based, right? So that's not that's a problem. It's just the dairy products, that's all. That's Thank right. you, Dr. Teji. Thank that you very much. An important right. question. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I think uh, we have had a wonderful um, opportunity to hear you speak and uh, on behalf of IMA and the Educational Committee, we do want to thank you so very much. Uh, we've had an, uh, an excellent audience. I think everybody enjoyed it very much. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gondala, for moderating. And at this time, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Jyoti Patel, who's also a Patel, who is also a co-chair for Health Education Committee. She would like to thank Dr. Sriliksha for the wonderful talk. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Shah for presenting to IMA of Illinois and also thank everyone for attending. I would like to express appreciation for your ability to present the subject in a very interesting way. Thank I you. myself being a vegetarian learned a lot and thank you again for making a memorable <laughs> evening. We hope you can join us again and thank you yep. for your valuable contribution. No problem. And thank now... You. Dr. Arsur, on behalf of IAMA of Illinois, would like to present a certificate in appreciation to Dr. Shah. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Dr. Shah, we seem to have a lot more questions. I presume they can come uh, visit the website that you had put up earlier and ask you further questions, I hope, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, no problem. Sure. Thank you very much. You're Thanks, welcome. everyone. I can provide my email. I think it will be also more direct. Sure. Do you want to put it on the chat or do you want to? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Or I can uh, stop sharing this. So if you want, you can put it up as well. Okay, there it is. Okay, that's very simple. Yeah, Dr. Esha, I was one yeah. of the lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> so that is uh, DR for doctor and then Sha at gmail.com. Yes. Thank you very I much. Check the Dr. Shah at gmail. I was a little too late because I tried, but that Dr. Shah at gmail is a plastic surgeon in Hollywood. So I see. I can <laughs> with him. <laughs> <Dr. Esha. laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful evening, good night, and please join us for our future programs. Thanks, Dr. Shah. Appreciate it. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Shah.